there have been people that have walked on the surface of the moon. Just incredible, just amazing. The Apollo astronauts read Genesis chapter one from space. They don't find life in space. In fact, astronomers are asking themselves, where is everybody? I would only favor the trip to Mars under one condition, that I'm one of the astronauts. I think humanity would be much better served if we were to explore space with the purpose of glorifying its creator, rather than trying to prop up a humanistic view of origins. Space agencies from around the world have spent billions of dollars exploring the universe. Whether it's the missions to the moon, probes to other parts of our solar system, the space station, or space telescopes, the more we learn, the more clearly it points back to our creator. The information has allowed creation astronomers to study the sun, moon, and stars. Not only has it had major impact on Christians around the world, but also on these astronomers personally. The space program has always fascinated me. Just the idea that human beings now can leave our planet is phenomenal, absolutely amazing. We have learned so much about the other planets and about the universe because of the space probes, that the telescopes we have in orbit around the Earth. There are a number of different space programs out there, and they've all been just tremendous. I've been so thrilled, especially the Voyager programs. They had the spacecraft that went past Jupiter, Saturn. Voyager 2 also went past Uranus and Neptune. And I still remember when that happened. I was pretty young when it went past Uranus and Neptune, but I remember it. And it, we had these amazing images of these worlds, such beauty that God placed out there for, like gems for us to find, Easter eggs for us to find out there and to enjoy Him all the more. Very exciting, very exciting. That some of these outer places, even like Saturn, it's an interesting planet. Saturn has a lot of carbon in it. It has a lot of pressure because Saturn's much bigger than the Earth. There's some speculation that the whole inside of Saturn may be a diamond bigger than the whole Earth. Well, now that's a treasure, that's value. Diamonds are good even for industrial and for optical use. There are resources like that in space that maybe God intended for us to go out and get and make use of and to haul back home here. But you wonder about the potential of these far off places or an asteroid composed of pure iron nickel. It'd be worth trillions of dollars. Space is full of treasures like this. Whether that was originally thought possibly for this age or whether it's for a future age, I don't know, but we don't know what's out there. Growing up in the 1970s, I remember the Viking landings on Mars and how much excitement there was surrounding that. Subsequent missions, the Voyager missions were wonderful. We're learning a tremendous amount about the cosmos. A lot of people don't realize that there have been medical discoveries that have been made because there's certain things you can only do in a microgravity environment. So we have the space station up there where they can test how things react under certain environments. Maybe when you're on the front end of science, maybe right out of grad school, you think, okay, I've learned something new and we're gonna capture this whole thing and, and figure out the whole system and have a theory of everything. But as time goes by, as you watch the journal articles and see what we do, I realize more and more how little we really know. We don't know what gravity is. We don't know what light is. Is it a particle? Is it a wave? We just live with that, it's both. And this is true of everything and we certainly don't automatically know the origin of anything, at least naturalistically. So there are things that we do know and we have a lot of useful inventions and applications and solutions to problems, but there's much more that is far beyond us. One thing that I thought was fascinating was a spider they took up in space to see if it could build a web in zero G. And my understanding is its first attempt failed, but because spiders naturally build webs with a little bit of, you know, so that the gravity is the right way, but it eventually figured it out and was able to build a web in zero G, an environment that it would never encounter on Earth. How amazing that God designed that little thing to be able to do that in an environment that it would never encounter on Earth. But every answer we come up with leads to multiple new questions. 
we learn more and more about less and less, and it just keeps getting narrower and narrower. It's like there's a whole universe inside every little particle. That is the complexity, just like there is inside a living cell. That's what I see in nature, that the deeper we go, the richer, the more variety it is, and the more questions that come up. I think it's a valid thing to want to explore the universe and just to see the wonders that are there that God has put there for us. So you see, these things, they just bring glory to God. We just need to recognize that. That's the problem with the secularists. They do these programs and they don't give glory to the God who makes this all possible. But if we give God glory for what he's made, then the space program is just a wonderful asset. I enjoy science. Some people maybe kind of want to stay away from it just because of the anti-God directions that some of the leaders have gone into, but it's for us. I think we've got the best reason for enjoying creation and nature and exploring it as well. There was one moment in history when the United States came together as never before or since to explore a new world, our moon. These missions to the moon had a huge impact, not only on the entire world, but on the very minds of some young men that would use it to glorify God. I've always been in particular fascinated with the Apollo missions. The idea of that moon that I looked at in my telescope, there have been people that have walked on the surface of the moon. What an incredible moment. In 1962, I was in second grade, this is spring of 62, and John Glenn was doing his first mission around the world. He went up three orbits in the Friendship 7. We talked about it in class, remember we had the time we colored that day, uh, one kid colored a piece of construction paper, the Friendship 7 on the side. And I remember I raised my hand at one point, we were talking about orbiting over, and I raised my hand and asked the teacher, I said, well, I've seen planes fly over. I said, well, could we look up in the sky and see them go by? And she said, no, it's too high, too far away. Well, as it turns out, it was daytime then, but it was dark. You can actually see this thing go over by reflected sunlight early in the evening and so forth. So that was the first actual space shot I remembered. I don't remember the Shepard uh, flight a year earlier, the first suborbital flight we did with an astronaut. My parents said we stopped along the highway and listened on the radio, the coverage of the thing, but I was you know, first grade, didn't really remember. In Christmas of 1968, the Apollo astronauts read Genesis chapter one from space, looking back on the earth. And I was not a saved person at that time when I heard that, but I know that God used that event to make a dent on my mind. And I was saved the year after that. And I wasn't alive at the time to see it in person. I still look back at the footage and the news reporters, and I think it was Walter Cronkite, who just, he can't believe it when it's happening live. He says, live from the surface of the moon, and you got Neil Armstrong stepping out of that ladder. Incredible, what an achievement. What an achievement that we've been able to leave our planet and put people on another celestial object out there. Just incredible, just amazing just finished my freshman year of high school and waiting for my sophomore year and it was a big time we were all excited I watched it that night it was on a Sunday evening it was a warm evening and I kept going outside it was the first quarter moon and I kept going outside during I'm watching on TV it started about 9 30 or so and I kept going outside and looking up at the sky and seeing the moon and thinking they're up there you know I came back in I go back up there I kept went in and out the door a number of times that would have been school days for me and I remember that the landing was late at night as they were showing it. This was back in the days of black and white TV. and We didn't have one. We went over to the neighbors. And that was all rather exciting to think about how they could pull that off. And I think there was some good healthy pride in U.S. engineering to make that possible to go to the moon and return. I have a sister and my parents, and we came home from church that night. It was a Sunday night, after all. They had a snack, and my sister and my parents went to bed before this thing started. And the reason why was, you know, back then, something like this got wall-to-wall -wall coverage. There were only three networks then. They didn't have cable and stuff. Got wall-to-wall -wall coverage all evening and under the night. And they went to bed early because they were in a snit that they couldn't watch a rerun of Bonanza. <laughs> so I was the only one in my household watching it that night. I thought that was pretty strange that uh, there were probably only three people in the country who weren't watching what was going on. It was an exciting time with Neil Armstrong on the moon in 69. You young people just missed out on it, didn't you? 
We'd read about that in science fiction books for a long time. So it was a strange feeling seeing it actually happening on TV. <laughs> well, I was three years old when Neil Armstrong first walked on the moon, and I remember watching it on TV. I mean, I was totally transfixed in front of the television. But that's actually the first memory that I can pin a date to, three years old, but I do remember that. It had such a big impact on me. And for a while, like I think probably everybody else of that era, I was going to be an astronaut when I grew up. That didn't work out, oh well, but I've loved space and such ever since. Well, at that point, a lot of things happened about that time. That was in July. I was really getting into astronomy. I had found a man on my paper route who was really into astronomy a few months before that, so we were touching base quite a bit using his telescope, and I got a telescope a little later on. Uh, probably about October that year, I rededicated my life and felt the call to be an astronomer for God's glory. So a lot of things were going on. I can't say that the Apollo 11 moon landing you know, directly caused me to become an astronomer, but it didn't hurt at all, so it did help a little bit. A very important time in my life. And I know there are some skeptics today who say we never went and the whole thing is a hoax. And I work with college students and some of them get confused. They say, did we go to the moon? And I tell these kids, there are people around who are trying to confuse you and they're rewriting history and they're anti-government people and be careful of them. Yes, we did go to the moon. We left instruments up there that are still being monitored. It's a wonderful part of our history exploring creation. So anyway, yeah, all of us that were around at that time do remember that event and it's just one of those marks in history. Our world was forever changed by the missions to the moon. It was the first time that man got to escape the bounds of Earth. But what about the future? What will upcoming missions look like? From a practical perspective, it's more economical to do unmanned missions. It's expensive. If you're going to put people out in space, you have to take a bit of the Earth's environment with you. Earth's designed for life, space isn't, and so we have to take a little bit of Earth's envelope with us, and that costs money. I'm not too keen on manned space probes anymore because we can do things with robotic and distance programs we could never do in the past. So uh, maybe the time for manned space flight, at least leaving the Earth, is come and gone. The benefits, though, of studying the universe, whether it's a manned mission or an unmanned mission, the benefits are extraordinary. Manned and robotic missions have been incredibly successful in helping us to learn much about what God has created. But an even bigger jump in our understanding happened in the 1990s when we launched the Hubble Space Telescope using the Space Shuttle Discovery. While one of the project's goals was to discover answers to the secular origin of the universe, it has instead confirmed order, design, and creativity of God. The Hubble Telescope has been one of the best investments that we've ever made in space science. Some of the motivation was secular, to understand an evolutionary origin, to try to bolster an evolutionary origin of the universe. But I think a lot of it is good, honest scientific exploration. We just want to see what's out there. Well, the Hubble Space Telescope has been a huge boon to astronomy. It's not just the pretty pictures, but also the science you can do. The advantages of it is that it's above the Earth's atmosphere where you don't have the blurring of the Earth's atmosphere and also you can reach some wavelengths you can't get from the Earth. What a remarkable spacecraft and we've been able to see farther out than we have before and with super crisp details because it's above Earth's atmosphere. It's uh, fantastic what you can do and you can push the envelope quite a bit and I'm pleased we have it. We've had it now for over 20 years. It's been amazing what that spacecraft has done. I don't think a lot of people realize it but it, the Hubble Space Telescope is designed to be able to hold several different instruments in it, and they're interchangeable. It's actually had a number of different instruments on it, and they've swapped them out over the years. And I think it can hold four at a time, something like that. You know, there's different instruments on it. I think many people watching this in the future may say, what are you talking about? It came down, it's gone, you know? But it's a great thing. It's gonna be replaced with the James Webb Telescope, is the plan. It's gonna be bigger and better. If you think the Hubble was neat, the way to the web goes. It's a huge, huge thing. I just can't tell you enough how important the Hubble has been. It's, a, it's been a fantastic bit of science, probably the most significant telescope we've ever had. And the number of discoveries we've made with Hubble are amazing, and none of them have confirmed evolution. All of them confirm creation, so not that I'm surprised.
Like other space exploration, the Hubble telescope has given astronomers so much data to show the design and purpose of our universe. But ironically, even their discoveries point back to a creator. Their motivation is to discover how the universe came into existence without God. One example is their presupposition that evolution is true and happening elsewhere throughout the universe. Well, a lot of us have grown up with the space program, and I know some people might be a little bit suspicious about it because it always seems like in the newspaper articles they're looking for aliens, they're looking for Martians, and it's so irritating the way they do that forever. I think it's sad that a lot of the space program is done with the wrong motives. So much of it seems to be driven by the desire to find life somewhere else. The underlying tone in a lot of this is that since life evolved here by itself, maybe it evolved somewhere else too. And then they seem to make a corollary. If we found life somewhere else, that would support the idea of origin of life here by itself from chemicals. And I think it's sad that so much of that way of thinking has permeated our culture and our society today. Well, unfortunately, the space program has changed. This is not your father's NASA. And NASA didn't talk about origins a whole lot back in the 60s and stuff, but today everything, they put a spin on it. Seven, eight years ago, I went to an astronomy meeting and they had Mr. Golden, the head of NASA, come and give a talk. And everything then was this big push with the called origins, everything about origins of life, origins of the universe. I was really repulsed by all of this because it was very evolutionary. They've backed off a little bit now, but uh, still, evolution is just being talked about all the time with NASA-related programs, finding the origin of everything. And I find that off-putting. You don't have uh, to do that. As they market the space program for funding, they do push the idea of finding aliens, finding life in space, and there seems to be a lot of interest in that. That sometimes surprises me. NASA has millions of hits of people looking, you know, what have you found for aliens? I think that's probably driven by the media in a big part. Of course, they don't find life in space. In fact, astronomers are asking themselves, where is everybody? If evolution works, if a material comes together to make life, it should have happened here and there, and they should be communicating with us, but it doesn't happen at all. They keep resuscitating this idea that maybe life once existed on Mars. They're very optimistic. We've slammed that door shut so many times. I don't know how many times you have to keep slamming it. They still keep talking about, well, there's a little liquid water here or there, and we find fossils and all these sorts of things. I think that's barking at the wrong tree. Mars is a fascinating object, a fascinating planet. There are better reasons for going to Mars than just prove evolution is true somehow. It's a fascinating world in its own right, and we've had the technology to go to Mars for 40 years. We just don't have the political will. To do it right would cost well over a trillion dollars, probably. And we just don't have the political will to spend that kind of money to do that. So, as a taxpayer, I would oppose that. I would only favor the trip to Mars under one condition that I'm one of the astronauts. Unfortunately, some of the people I work with would demand that it be a one-way trip. The verse in Psalms says, the earth he gave to man, but the heavens belong to God. These kind of references don't seem to leave a lot of room for other alien civilizations. But if we found some kind of plant life in some recesses of Mars or somewhere else, that would not be fatal to the Christian or creation worldview. It would be interesting. We would either conclude that it was contaminated from the earth that got started up there, or maybe God did put something like that. It's really an option for us. Not intelligent, evolved life, and I don't think God created life elsewhere. Again, no indication of that. But whether there's some kind of vegetation, time will tell. I think humanity would be much better served if we were to explore space with the purpose of glorifying its creator rather than trying to prop up a humanistic view of origins. Sadly, there's a lot of effort being placed into the search for extraterrestrial life. Part of this research seeks to discover new planets where evolution might have taken place. There's been a lot of investment in finding Earth-like planets orbiting other stars. I think the primary motivation is they really want to find life. 
And as I've said earlier, I don't expect that they'll find life out there. But I'm certainly open to the idea that they might find a world that is similar to Earth in many other ways. There could be a planet that's orbiting within the habitable zone of its star where the temperatures are right for liquid water. There are frequent reports in the media about how we just found a planet in the habitable zone around its star. And I think we need to take a lot of that with a grain of salt. Oftentimes the habitable zone is being defined rather loosely. A lot of times we'll see a planet orbiting a red dwarf star, for example. And red dwarfs tend to be unstable and can flare frequently. And it's sort of like saying that there's a habitable zone around a ticking time bomb. Yes, you may have enough air to breathe and it may be nice and warm, but that doesn't mean you're going to be able to live there for very long. Of course, we've got eight planets at our home base here, but we are finding lots of new planets, over a thousand new ones, and I'm sure there's a lot more than that. They don't seem to be Earth-like, but planets. A place where some living thing might live if he's close to a mother star. To have a habitable planet, you need a lot more than just a certain distance from a star and a certain level of warmth or whatever. The Earth is uniquely designed for us to live here, and it serves that purpose very well. In the secular community's desire to support non-Christian ideas about where we came from and what else might be out there, I think we see a lot of reaching and grasping for things and a lot of overstating their case in planets like this. Secular astronomers see planet Earth as just one of possibly millions of other planets that can support life. But Isaiah 45, 12 says, It is I who made the earth and created man upon it. I stretched out the heavens with my hand and ordained all their hosts. God created the earth with a special purpose, to be home to a people that he created in his own image. And that sets us apart from any other planet in the heavens. I think one of the major things we've learned is how special the Earth is and how well designed it is for us to be here. Well, even within our solar system, when we see the variety of planets and the various conditions and how hostile everywhere else is to life, whereas we flourish here. Even as we're looking outward to other solar systems, we're discovering planets circling other stars. We don't know enough about these planets to know their conditions completely, but we do see that many of these are very hostile places as well. We're seeing large planets orbiting very closely to their stars. Very, very inhospitable places are where life would not be possible. If you want to distill it down, I think the one thing I see repeatedly is what a very special place the Earth is. Our Earth is a unique planet and we are in a privileged sort of situation, I think, across the world. And the things we discover keep reinforcing the idea in my mind uh, more than anything else. Secular astronomers have always said that our solar system isn't anything special. That solar systems like ours will just inevitably form when given the right conditions of enough material and so on. Now as we're discovering planets elsewhere and we're finding other solar systems that are very much unlike our own, we're seeing large Jupiter-sized planets orbiting very closely to their parent stars. Well, our secular solar system model says that that can't happen. A Jupiter-sized planet can't form there, yet that's what we're seeing. We're seeing planets that are orbiting their stars inclined greatly to the rotation of the star, in some cases even going retrograde, backwards. Secular models say planets can't form that way. Well, that's what we see. So I think it's very interesting that assumptions that were made by secular astronomers coming at it from a non-Christian viewpoint and saying, we must be ordinary because if we weren't ordinary, that would smack of special creation, and we know that's forbidden. God's got his secrets, he knows his things and what he's put out there in space. All I can do is go by scripture where I know the earth is special. It was here even before the sun, moon, and stars, and the Lord Jesus walked here. Now as we're discovering more and more things, whether within our solar system or outside of it, we're seeing that we look very special after all. And that some of the fundamental secular assumptions about the universe are being challenged the way they are. When space agencies use a secular worldview to interpret the data, it leads them to the wrong conclusions. However, when they just report their discoveries without bias, it will always confirm God's creation.
What we see in space is certainly uh, large and vast, and there's certainly unending variety. But I think the whole thing shows that um, it's running down. Things are wearing out. Of course, God controls the rate at which this is going down. But it looks to us like a one-way trip, that there was a perfect creation at the start, and it's been winding down ever since, kind of heading towards some sort of destination. I think that's what the space age really shows us, along with the beauty, even in view of the decline of the universe, just the color and the beauty and the variety. And I'm sure that there are types of stars and objects out there that we haven't even thought of yet, things much more exotic than a pulsar or a black hole. Who knows what kind of interesting physical objects God's placed in deep space. Now, there have been some Christians who have been a little bit leery of the space program, given that God gave us dominion over the earth and so on. But as long as we're doing what God says we're supposed to do, as long as we are taking care of the earth, as long as we're not violating God's law, then I say that what we do is good if it brings glory to God. And certainly understanding more about His creation, I think, gives Him glory. We're never going to be able to fully comprehend the glories of God. But in as much as He has revealed some of that to us in our finite capability to understand, I think it's absolutely a worthwhile endeavor. Now, that doesn't mean it's the most important thing. I think it would be more important to spend resources on evangelism and trying to rescue the lost than to spend billions sending someone to Mars or whatever. If we went to the moon out of rebellion against God to say we're so great, that would be bad. But that wasn't the motive, I don't think, behind those programs. And I mean, the astronauts, when they landed on the moon, the first thing they did was they took communion. Not a lot of people know that. Yeah, they actually took communion on the moon. When the Apollo 8, when they orbited the moon and then they read from Genesis, I thought, wow, how cool is that? There's just no greater thing that they could do than to read from Genesis. Creation is uh, not simple. There are just depths to it that go on and on. And that's kind of encouraging in a way, if, if you like to explore nature, that there's plenty to do. I have to wonder if God would have allowed us to explore these other worlds had we not sinned. The main reason we can't travel to these other worlds is the time involved. We would die first, but if we hadn't sinned, there would be no death. And so there'd be no problem traveling into space and visiting some of these other worlds. I have to wonder if maybe God would have allowed us to go to some of these other worlds and start colonies there and things like that. That's not going to happen today, but ultimately because of sin. But I expect that there are worlds out there that are Earth-like, and I don't expect there will find life on any of those worlds. We're never going to figure it all out. Probably even in heaven there'll be lots to work on if, if this is a thing that you like to do. It would be fun to go if we could. <laughs> God hasn't said that we can't, and maybe we'll go there in the future during the Millennial Kingdom or the new heavens and the new earth. I think we've got the best reason for space research, including these wonderful pictures that are returned from space. I think we can enjoy them most of all because we know who set up the whole system in the first place. Proverbs 25.2 says, It's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it's the glory of kings to seek them out. I think it's a valid purpose for us to try to seek to see and understand more of what God has done. I think He likes us to explore things and explore His creation. He delights in it. Why shouldn't we also delight in it? So I think when we go into space, as long as we're doing it in a way that is God-honoring, there's no commandment against it, and as long as we're fulfilling God's other commands, that brings God glory to learn more about His creation and to appreciate Him even more. Much of the space program is designed to find out how the universe could have originated without a God. But ironically, their discoveries keep showing the very design and purpose of God's creation, to bring Him glory. Just as the psalmist wrote thousands of years ago, the heavens declare the glory of God. <music>